did Paul and James preach different gospels? That's a claim that is made by some. If you don't understand the question, I, I can explain it to you. Uh, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians said this, he said, for by grace you have been saved, we just sang it, grace and grace alone. So Paul writes to the Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. So saved by grace through faith, emphatically not of works. That's Paul. James, in his epistle, writes this, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Faith apart from works is dead. So, Which one is it? Are Paul and James preaching different gospels? Paul saying you're saved by grace through faith and not of works. And James saying that you're saved by your works. One of the answers is that they're not preaching different gospels. They're preaching the exact same gospel. But they're looking at the topic of salvation from different angles, if you will. So it's as if... Uh, Paul is standing over here from this side and he's looking at salvation and what actually saves somebody. And he says that your works cannot lead to your salvation. Your, your works are not what saves you. So if you're thinking about what it means to become a Christian, if you're thinking about what it means to be saved, you don't do that by working your way up to heaven. You don't do that by working your way to God. We have an infinite gap between us and God because of our sin against a perfect holy God. And no, no amount of good works you can do can do that. Salvation is a free gift of God. So Paul is standing on this side of it looking at salvation and saying, your, your, your works can't save you. James is over here saying, yep, absolutely true. I agree with what Paul said. But from this side of salvation, once you're saved, looking back at that same event, saying if you don't have works that go along with it, then you actually don't have this thing to begin with. So, so your works don't save you. It's by grace Now, uh, through faith that somebody is saved. But then once you're saved, you will have works that spring forth out of a heart that's been saved. And so James is looking at it from this side. Paul's looking at it from that side. Well, that second angle is what we're going to consider in our text this morning. The, The reality that without works, faith is dead. And I want, I want you to have in mind the question of why is this distinction so important? Why is that reality that your works matter? So your actions, your deeds, your speech, your life, your discipleship in the Lord, that that all of that is very, very important. That matters. So have in your mind, why is that reality that your works matter? Why is that truth so essential to the Christian life? Because it is. Or if you'll join me in Matthew chapter 21, that's where we'll be this morning. If you haven't been with us recently or you're a new visitor this morning, we're glad to have you. We are going through a series in the parables. And so we're just uh, mainly in Matthew and Luke jumping around and looking at different parables of Jesus up until we get to the, the summer months. And this morning we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 to 32, looking at the parable of the two sons. Matthew 21, verses 28 to 32. As we look at this, I want us to see that faithfulness is follow-through. Faithfulness is follow-through. We will see that in our text, Matthew 21. You can follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read, starting in verse 28. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two 
did the will of his father. They said, he's talking to some religious leaders, we'll, I'll give you the context in just a minute, but they said, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. The parable of the two sons. We're going to look at these in, in kind of two different groups. We're going to consider one son and then the other and the application uh, that he's making to this group before them. So we'll look first of all at those who don't get it. Our text begins in verse 28 with Jesus asking a question. He says, what, what do you think? And this cues us in. He's in some sort of a dialogue already. He's in some sort of a conversation already. And what is happening in the passage right before this is that he, he's, so Jesus is challenging with that question. He's challenging some of the religious leaders of his day because the context is a conversation that he's having with the chief priests and the elders. And they've just questioned Jesus by questioning his authority. They said, wait, by what authority do you do these things and who gave you this authority? So these religious leaders are kind of challenging Jesus. They're seeing his powerful teaching and his cleansing of the temple and all, all these things that he's doing and uh, curse, he just cursed the fig tree in the passage right before that. And, and, and the, these people, or these religious leaders around him said, by what th authority do you do these things and who gave you this authority? That's in Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. Now, instead of answering them, uh, Jesus uh, was a master at this. And so Jesus just poses another question to them. And he says, if you answer my question, then I'll answer yours about my authority. And so my question to you is about John's baptism. And what he means by that is really John's baptism, meaning the ministry of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was this forerunner who came to make way the ready, uh, make ready the, the, the way of the Lord for when Jesus came. And so Jesus says the baptism of John, right, the ministry of John the Baptist, was that of human origin or divine origin. The, the ministry of John. And so they kind of get together and they discuss it and they're like, oh shoot, kind of catch 22 here. If we say, yeah, we think that his ministry was divine, then everybody, he's going to say, well, why aren't you following him then? So we can't say that. But if we say it's only human origin, everybody around here loves Jesus and John, so the crowds are going to get mad at us. So they come back and they're like, no answer. <laughs> they come back and they're like, we can't answer. And Jesus says, all right, well, neither will I answer your question then. And then he says this, what do you think? So that's the context. He's in this kind of verbal tussle with these religious leaders and they don't answer, so he says he won't either. He confounds them. And then to these religious leaders, to these religious leaders who Jesus, who have, uh, they have a problem with Jesus, right? These religious leaders who are doubting him. And so they, they've, they've, they don't want to go on record about John's ministry because they don't want to go on record about Jesus' ministry either. And so they, they're doubting him. They're calling into question his authority to these religious leaders who, who aren't bought in enough to say that John was on a divine mission, or these religious leaders who, who, who aren't bought in enough to know that uh, John was making the way for the Messiah, to these religious leaders who are ignoring the preaching about the kingdom that's been happening to this group, Jesus rattles off three parables in a row that serve as a rebuke to, this, to these religious leaders. And the first one, the first of those three parables that are kind of a rebuke in this context of this question about authority is the focus of our text this morning. The parable itself is pretty simple. You probably don't need a whole lot of explanation of what's going on here, right? There's, there's a father and he has two sons and he goes to them separately and individually and asks them both to go serve in the vineyard. And the first son says that he's not going to do it, but then he changes his mind and he goes and ends up working in the vineyard anyway. The second son says he will do it, but he never shows up on the job. Again, I want to look at both of those sons in turn and who they represent. So let's think first about those who, who kind of get it wrong, right? The, the, those who are, are being corrected with this parable. It's the second son. That's who these religious leaders were in the parable. Jesus is telling this parable to show them that they are the second son, right? The, the second son talks a big game. The, the second son is initially committed, but then he doesn't show up. And thus, he, he does not do the will 
of his father. Right? Saying all of the right words is ultimately meaningless if you don't back it up with action and obedience. Making an initial verbal commitment needs, means nothing if you don't actually do the thing you said you were going to do. That's the state of the religious leaders in Jesus' day. They said they loved God. They said they valued God's word. They said that they wanted to do his will, but they actually didn't do any of those things. Words are easy to say, but follow through is how we know. And you know this is true. right? So it's the difference between saying that you're, you're, you're sorry to somebody rather than showing that you're sorry versus repentance and an ongoing uh, uh, kind of lifestyle that shows your sorrow and your apology and your repentance. Right, it's the difference between agreeing to Delray Baptist Church's church covenant for you church members here, right? We, we agreed when we became members to we will use our words to build up one another and to glorify God rather than speaking lies and deceit and slander and gossip. Our church covenant says we will rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, helping to carry each other's burdens. We've agreed that we said we will cheerfully and regularly contribute to the support of the ministry, the needs of the church, and the relief, relief of the poor. So it's the difference between saying, yeah, sure, I'll do that. I'll sign up on that versus, versus us living it out when it's hard, <laughs> living it out when times are tough. Right? It's taking a job, vowing that you're going to use this job that the Lord provided for you to really make a difference, to honor him in the way you work and use it as an opportunity to glorify him. Saying that, that's your vow, that's your commitment versus prayerfully and intentionally with accountability putting that into practice through uh, proactive uh, presence in your place of occupation. Right? It's, it's, it's saying vows at an altar when you get married versus the years of living those out. Those things take a moment to say but a lifetime to live out. You get the point, right? Talk is cheap, as they say. In the same way, and most importantly, we can say we are on team Jesus and then not do what he's asked of us. We are all in this parable. Right? We're all being called to work in the vineyard. Sadly, many who say that they'll be there don't show. In my experience, not all who decline to work, as it were, do so with the same posture. I think it's helpful to think through, to identify ways in which this disease might be manifesting itself. And trying to follow God versus not truly doing the Father's will. Let me suggest for you five workers that I've met. Or five workers that I've been in my own life. The first worker is the ignorant worker. right? Someone who says, well, Jesus is calling us to work in the vineyard. And he said, I actually didn't know that this was what I was being called to do. Right? I, I, I thought this whole Christianity thing was just kind of checking a box on a form. <laughs> I thought it was just kind of like. How do you identify? Sure, I identify as a Christian. I, did, I didn't know that I was actually being asked to do more than that. It was just kind of an identifier for me. Maybe you just never had that modeled for you. right? It's not just, I thought it was just about picking religious affiliation. Sorry, I didn't, didn't know that there was more expected of me. The ignorant worker. The seasonal worker. Right? Some... Say, okay, yeah, I realize that, that God's calling me to obey him and, and, and uh, live a life of, of following him and, and showing that by my work, showing that and how I live. But, but uh, there's some other season is the time to live that out. Maybe, maybe a season passed. Yeah, my college days were really the glory days of, of putting it all on the line and following Jesus. Or maybe it's a future season. Hey, I'll, I'll get to that like we talked about last week. I'll, I'll get to that after I make my money. I'll get to that after our kids are out of the house. I'll get to that whenever it is. It's a seasonal worker. The tired worker. It's impossible to do this. Work in the vineyard? Gosh, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard work. So why bother? Right? Telling Jesus I'm on his team is way easier than actually going out and doing the work. I just don't have the energy or the inclination to do all of that. The optional worker. Right? It's not that I didn't know that working was expected. I knew that that was expected and I, I thought about it, but I was just going to get to it after all this other stuff. It's kind of an extracurricular thing to go and do what Jesus is asking of me. Or the social worker, right? I'll do it, but only for the attention. Saying that I'm showing up publicly 
before others, and hey, I want Team Jesus, that really got me all the war, or reward I was looking for in the first place. I, it got me, that, that was the win, that was the clout, was to just say that I was on Team Jesus socially without living it out. Whatever our posture, church, we were being called to trust Christ and to be all in. Right? And that's what I love about this parable, that trust Christ peace. Because here's the key that's easy to miss when we read this passage together. Though everything that we just said is true, right, and I think is in the parable. You have the son who's being asked to go and work, and he says, yeah, I'll go do it, and he never shows up to work. Right? There's ways that we're tempted to do that. There's ways that that disease is in us. There's ways that that is present in our lives. Everything we just said is true and is in the parable, but there's more to the story. It's not just that the religious, believer, uh, the, the, the religious leaders believed but didn't practice. Right, you have to see that in the story. It, it, as if they had proper knowledge, but there was kind of a laziness or a disconnect for them between the head and the hands, between the knowing and the doing. It, it's not as if they really had the belief part down, but they just failed to act on it for whatever reason. No, look at verse 32. Look at verse 30. This is, this is the opposite, opposite side of that same coin. Look at verse 32. The issue was an issue of belief. You see, Jesus says, for John came to you, after he tells the parable, he says, John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. Now, the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. But you, even when you saw it, you didn't not afterwards change your mind and believe him. You see that three times in the text, believe him. Right, their issue was an issue of belief. John came in the, in the way of righteousness. Right, John came, says John came in the way of righteousness, meaning he, he came preaching about the way of righteousness, that there was a way to be made right with God. Righteousness is what we need that we can't get on our own. And John the Baptist came saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You can be righteous by believing in him. You can be righteous by trusting him. That's how John came and these people said, I don't need all that. And they didn't believe him. Again, John the Baptist was, was called a forerunner for Jesus. He came declaring the way of the Lord. He came, he came saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he was a huge signpost, a big neon sign, a big arrow pointing to Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. And Jesus then comes on the scene preaching that same message, repent and believe. Believe, believe, believe. But they wouldn't do it. Their issue was an issue of belief. Do you see that in the text? Is that surprising to you as you read this parable? It is for me because the way that this parable goes, we might expect the application of it to be something about how the religious leaders aren't working in the vineyard as they ought to. Right? He tells this whole story and there's this whole, the, one of the sons says that he's going to show up and then he doesn't show up. You might expect Jesus to then turn to the Pharisees and be like, hey, where have you guys been? Why haven't you been working? Why haven't you, why haven't you been doing stuff? Why haven't you been given to the poor? Why haven't you been coming to church? Right, but that's not what he says. Right, he turns to them and he says, your problem is that you don't believe. That's your problem. Right, their issue was one of belief. Now it works itself out, right? It, it works itself out in the fact that they aren't working in the vineyard as they ought to work. That's true. But that's actually downstream from their disbelief. They didn't do the will of the Father, but it wasn't just an issue of obedience. It was that they didn't believe Jesus. So church, basically, we, we, we can say we're spiritual. Right? We can say that we're religious. We can say that we're Christians. We can say that we are followers of God. But if we don't show up and reveal those claims as being true by our lives, then our talk is cheap. And the reason our talk is cheap is because we actually don't believe disbelief breeds disobedience. And on that point, perhaps some helpful application here might be for you just to, even to think about your own fight with sin. Right? Your, your own battle, as Paul puts it in Romans 8, to by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the flesh so that you may live. Your own struggle with sins and reflect on, on how much of our sin can be traced back to what we believe about God. It's not a rhetorical thing. I actually want you to think about that. 
So for example, we talked about coveting last week in the parable. Coveting and greed. Right? Coveting and greed isn't just the fact that you're like, hey, I want some stuff. <laughs> and I want what that person has. It's not just that. It goes deeper than that. It's ultimately an issue of disbelief, isn't it? Right? I don't trust that God will give me what is good for me. Or, or maybe I think that God is actually withholding from me in some way what is good. And so I want what you have. I disbelieve God, and that's the trigger for why I covet or why I'm greedy. Or think about your lust. Right? I don't believe his timing is appropriate and good for me. And so my heart will sinfully long for gratification that is inappropriate. Rather than believing that the pure in heart will see God, I've adopted the mantra that the sexually gratified will feel fully alive. Or take your anger, sinful anger that is. It depends on what you, is making you angry, I suppose. But for me, it's I, 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 somewhere down in here, I disbelieve that the last will be first and the first will be last. And, and the way to be exalted is by being humbled. And the path to life is service, not propping yourself up. And so when things get in the way of that in my kingdom, I get mad. Right? Get out of my lane in traffic. Right? <laughs> right? Like there, there's, it's, it's a disbelief and a faith thing. Disbelieve what God has said in his word. You see this? There's disbelief that is often lurking behind why we do or why we don't do certain things. In our text this morning, that's exactly what was the problem with these religious leaders. You'll note that it goes deeper than that. Look at verse 32. Not only did they disbelieve, but it was a, it was a persistent, obstinate disbelief, wasn't it? He says, even when you saw it, the it there is sinners believing in John's message, right? They saw that. They saw people responding and lives changed. And he looks at the religious leaders he's like, even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe. Even with full evidence in front of them, they doubled down on their disbelief. There was no way they were showing up in the vineyard for the Father. They talk a big game, but they actually don't want to follow the Lord. And Jesus is here Rebuking anyone who would posture as a son, but who doesn't actually believe. And you can tell that they don't believe because they don't do what the father asked them to do. Michael Lawrence, a pastor up in Portland, has written this book. Uh, is in the Nine Marks, Building Healthy Churches. Probably my favorite Nine Marks book. Uh, they've, they've printed a ton of them. This is maybe number one for me. It's called Conversion. Um, I have... A shelf full of these. If anybody, uh, based on what we talk about here this morning, is like, I need to read that book, come see me after the service. Um, phenomenal book, uh, Conversion. And in this book, uh, the subtitle is How God Creates a People. Uh, and uh, Lawrence uh, investigates what it really looks like to be saved. What does it really look like to be converted? What does it really look like to be a Christian? And each chapter he presents kind of a counterfeit that often confuses the issue for us. The first chapter in the book is called new, not nice. He says that's what it means to be converted, is to be made new, not to be made nice. The the second son was super nice. Do you see that in the text? He was like, yes, sir. Right? I go, sir. He looked all put together. He looked all proper. Super nice guy. He'd love to have him over for dinner. Real polite. The religious leaders look all proper, but being nice is not the same thing as being made new. Having a new heart that actually loves Jesus. We must be made new in Christ. Not just be made nice. Actually have to believe him and trust him and have faith in him. Let's look at the other son. Kind of those who do get it. The religious leaders, right, whom Jesus is rebuking are the second son in the parable. They're contrasted with the first son who responds in the exact opposite way. And the father likewise in verse 28, if you look there, tells him to go to the vineyard. And the son in verse 29 uh, says, I will not. 
which would have been a shocking response in this context, given the authority of fathers in this culture. And so his son initially refuses, but then it says he, afterward he changed his mind and he went. You should note that phrase if you're kind of studying this passage on your own. Note that word, that phrase changed mind shows up twice in our passage. All right, so it just says it right there that the, the first son said, I will not, but then he changed his mind. And if you look down at verse 32, the note about, or the, the comment there about changed minds, it's repeated in verse 32. That's the exact thing the religious leaders wouldn't do is the thing that the first son did, right? Changed minds. They wouldn't change their minds about the ministry of John and therefore the ministry of Jesus. Not the first son. First son initially said no, but he changed his mind and went. It's exactly what the first son does. He goes and he works in the field as the father had asked him to do. Now listen, anytime you're studying parables, we've said this, Garrett said it, I've said it, don't, we don't need to press the parable to say things that it's not saying. Okay, so if you're reading this or, or press the parable to address things that it's not meant to address. So as a father, if I were to tell my four daughters to, hey, uh, I'd like you guys to go and clean the kitchen. And two of them say no. And then they end up going and doing it. And then two of them say, okay, I'll do it. And they never show up. Honestly, I'm not happy with all four of them. Right? Like, I'm not, like there's no winners for me in that situation. <laughs> Everybody's messed up. Uh, but but so, so don't take this and be like, gosh, what is going on here? I don't really, so don't press the parable to, to, to address all the things that we might think it, it uh, would be appropriate in our culture and in our context. Right? That, the point that Jesus is illustrating here, right, we're not meant to dissect the inappropriateness of the first son saying no, I don't think. Rather, look at the point Jesus is trying to make. Jesus is illustrating that those who do the Father's will are those who actually show up and do the Father's will. That's what he's trying to say. Regardless of their initial appearance, regardless of their initial reception, regardless of their initial interaction with the Father, if they actually follow and listen and obey, those are the ones who delight the Father. The religious leaders would have thought that that was them. All right, they were the obedient ones. They were the favorite sons of the father. But Jesus tells them, listen, the prostitutes and tax collectors got it together more than you guys do. Those who were loathed by the religious leaders. Right, they believed John. They believed Jesus. And were therefore the ones going into the kingdom of God before the religious leaders. Certainly not all the tax collectors as a class or all the prostitutes as a group, but there were those who were in those professions and had turned and saw Jesus and believed and trusted in him. And Jesus says those, even among this loathed class that you have, if they actually believed me, they're going into the kingdom of heaven. You said you were going to show up and you've done nothing because you actually don't believe me, you actually don't love me. They go into the kingdom of heaven before you. So church, this is, this is who we want to be in the story. Right? There is a father whose will is to be obeyed. There is, is, the pathway is by believing in the way of righteousness. That's been proclaimed and provided by another son. Right? There is a God whose kingdom is to be entered and the pathway into that kingdom is belief. I've said this already, but there is, a, there is a righteousness that we need but we lack. And it's got to be way better than the Pharisees and the tax collectors. Jesus literally says that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Matthew 5, 20 says this. He says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. And they were meticulous. Obeying the law so they thought with, to a T. They were tithing out of their spice rack in their kitchen. I mean, they were, they were, they were focused. They were meticulous. They wanted to, uh, to honor the, the word and what it said and obey all the commandments, all of them. They missed the entire point, but this is what they were trying to do. And Jesus says, unless your righteousness ex far exceeds theirs, you'll never enter in the kingdom of heaven. Our problem, though, friends, is that we're all sinners. 
Right? Not just that we do bad things, but sin has infected us. Sin is in our very nature. The reason we commit sins is because we're sinners. We have a fallen nature. And so what we need is a new nature, right? New, not nice. We need a, a changed nature, a new nature. We need a rebirth, a regeneration. We need a righteousness that there's no way we can accomplish on our own. And the only way for us to have that is as by Martin Luther, the way Martin Luther put it, is by receiving an alien righteousness. So Luther called it an alien righteousness, a righteousness that is apart from us, outside of us, not ours, but is coming into our world and given to us. It's an alien righteousness. A righteousness that we don't possess coming from the outside, credited to us by the perfect obedience of God the Son, Jesus Christ. And so what we do is we throw ourselves on him. We believe the son. We show up to do the father's will because of that. Because we believe the son. And we enter into the kingdom of God. Like these tax collectors and prostitutes. Because we believe the son. That's it. That's salvation. That's the good news of Christianity. You're like, well, that doesn't make sense. We don't do anything. Yep. That's the good news of Christianity. Right? Standing from this side. Looking and saying it's, it's by grace through faith, not works. We believe in Jesus, who was perfect in our place. And then his righteousness, just as our sin was credited to him, his righteousness is credited to us. It doesn't matter how you start out. Friends, it doesn't matter how you've messed up. It doesn't matter if you've been a hypocrite, if you've been a rebel, if you pushed Jesus away. It doesn't matter if you're here this morning, you haven't been to church in forever. It doesn't matter if you've struggled with doubt. It doesn't matter if you've said things that you wish you could take back. It doesn't mean if you've done things that you can't undo. And many of these things matter in the sense of making things right and seeking reconciliation in our lives. But none of those things preclude you from coming to the Father. Because just as the son who said to his father, no, I will not go, was able to change his mind Repent, change, go the other direction, and do the Father's will, so can you. That's what it means to repent, right? This is why Jesus identifies the first son with the tax collectors and the prostitutes. They were hated by the religious elites of his day. They were traitors. They were sinners. And they were. But if they turned from their sin and believed in Jesus, that is all that would matter. All of that worldly stuff is just noise. The church isn't a place for those who have made all the right decisions, those who have a spotless record, or those who look like they're all put together, those who aren't needy or desperate. No, it's a place for those like you and me who have changed our minds, who repent, who turn from our sin and trust in the Lord Jesus. We repent and we follow Jesus. We, we, we do that in kind of a as I've said before, kind of a big capital R, repent. And that's what it means to become a Christian, to, to repent, to turn from our sins and to trust in Jesus. As my way ain't going to do it. I'm trusting in you, Jesus. I need your righteousness. And then kind of a small case R all the way through life, living a life of repentance where we're constantly coming back and constantly uh, uh, remembering the mercy of the Lord Jesus and constantly repenting. This is the way of the Christian life. Well, how do you know if you're on the right track? There's a few questions to consider that may be helpful. Are you growing in humility? Are you growing in humility? The proud don't turn and trust. Right? That's what we saw with the religious leaders here. Even after they saw it, even after the evidence is right in front of them, they're like, nope, we can't do that. They're too proud. Are you growing in humility? Or others would that say that you are growing in humility. Do you have a willingness to change your mind? Are you happy to tell others you've changed your mind? What if that's something like a political position or some sort of policy thing that you've believed? Whether that's a theological position that you've held? Whether it's just something you said in a conversation yesterday? Are you happy to change your mind and tell others that you've done so? Or do you feel that, man, I'm on record, I need to ride this thing to the end? <laughs> I said it. I said I believed it. No going back now. That would be embarrassing. All right, well, you change your mind. 
do you sense and then act on conviction by the Spirit? Do you sense and then act on conviction by the Holy Spirit? One of our elders, like, it's become a kind of a saying among our elder board, is uh, the phrase, Holy Spirit, activate. <laughs> uh, one of our elders who remain nameless uh, likes to say, he sits in the front row over here, um, <laughs> likes to say that sometimes. And it's kind of caught on, like, Holy Spirit, activate, right? Um, do you sense that? Right? Whether it's like, man, I almost said this, but I felt the Spirit saying, don't say that. Right? I, I almost did this thing, but I felt the Spirit saying, don't do that. Or maybe you read it, maybe you did it, maybe you said it. But then you sense, ah, I should, shouldn't have said that. Holy Spirit, activate, right? Uh, I need to go back and say, listen, I know I said that. That was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. Right? You, you did the thing, and now you're like, ah, Holy Spirit has convicted you of that. Do you sense and then act on conviction by the Spirit? Do you need to be dragged into obedience or will you do it of your own accord? Do you need to be dragged into obedience or will you do it of your own accord? I think that's commendable with the, the son who says, I will not. There's nothing else in the text about any guilt trips or discipline that came his way, any judgment because of that. He said, I will not. And then it says, but afterward, he changed his mind. Is that true of you? You need to be dragged into obedience, kicking and screaming, or of your own volition and of your own accord. Do you believe in Jesus or do you believe Jesus? There's a massive difference between those two things. Satan believed in Jesus, right, in the sense that he was, he, he was there, he existed, he was a real guy. Do you believe in Jesus or do you believe him? Do you trust him? You say, he has spoken to me in his word and I've got to know it. Do you find yourself, based on the foundation of your faith, thinking about what it looks like to do God's will in the various arenas in your life? What what would it look like? Because of my belief, I want to show up to the vineyard and I want to work. I I, I want to do God's will. What does it look like for for me to do God's will as a husband? What does it look like for me to do God's will as a wife? What does it look like for us to do God's will as parents? What does it look like for me to do God's will in in school or with my classmates? What does it look like for me to do God's will in my relationships and with my roommates? What does it look like for me to do God's will at work, in my personal life, in my neighborhood? Do you find yourself thinking about what it looks like? What areas of obedience is God calling you into? What areas of stepping out in faith? One more question here. Are you willing... To be an evangelist against cultural Christianity. Are you willing to be an evangelist against cultural Christianity? I read a book a few years ago called The Unsaved Christian. I think I've used it as an illustration here before. The Unsaved Christian that argues that, that the, the biggest unreached people group in, uh, in our country is our Christians. <laughs> People who claim to be Christians and have kind of this veneer on them because of where they were raised or I prayed a prayer back when I was three or whatever it was, but, but who have no interest in living it out. It's a, it's a cultural Christianity. It's not an unreached people group, really. It's, it's an overreached people group. Whenever we moved to China back in 2014, we moved to China from nine years of living in the American South. So we lived uh, five years in uh, the nation of Texas, uh, and then we lived four years in Memphis, Tennessee, and then we moved to China. And one of my biggest delights, I, I, didn't, I didn't think about this, it wasn't something I was looking, like I knew I was looking forward to, but when I was in uh, Chinese culture, meeting Chinese friends, and then in kind of the uh, very kind of European pagan expat culture that we were living in, in China as well, so kind of a couple different worlds that we were operating in in China with with, uh, with, with uh, Chinese friends and then with, with friends from all over the globe, really, one of the things that was a huge delight for me was meeting somebody who would say, I'm not a Christian. I was like, thank you. I know what to do with you. Right? I know what kind of conversations to have. 
Like, I can handle I'm not a Christian. I actually love it. Let's go. Let's talk. What I couldn't handle was being in the South, and I couldn't find a non-Christian. Right? A non-Christian. Plenty of people. But everybody we, we tried to talk to, oh, no, yeah, I believe that. Friends, this is a huge call to ministry in our own area. There's unreached peoples, there's people from all over the world, there's that, but there's also a lot of folks who are the second son who say, yeah, yeah, I'll go, sure. They don't show up in the vineyard. Make it a point in your own relationships and friendships and neighborhood to, to not be okay. Or just taking that at face value. Oh, yeah, what does it look like to actually love Jesus and follow him? What does it look like to be a disciple? On that note, in the same way I concluded talking about the second son with a quote from Conversion, let me return to that well once again. There's another chapter, so the chapter I mentioned to you already was a chapter called New Not Nice. That's what it means to be converted, and that to be a nice person, to be, but, but to be made new. There's a, another chapter that Lawrence has in here called Disciples, Not Decisions. Disciples, Not Decisions. Being a Christian isn't about making a decision for Jesus, but about being, becoming a disciple of Jesus. Listen to what Lawrence writes. For many people today, especially in the West, religious conversion is like my decision to become a Red Sox fan. <laughs> I knew it. I, man, d- depraved, right? Yeah, that's right. I don't mean to make religious conversion as trivial as picking a baseball team, but in our culture, personal choice is at the heart of both. It's a lifestyle decision. Within most of evangelical Christianity, this decision is attached to the doctrine of eternal security. Once saved, always saved, people say. The important thing is making the decision. So just make it regardless of what you do with the rest of your life. Our, he says, is our role in conversion just making a decision? Is that the same thing as what Jesus calls repenting and believing? Given that eternity is at stake, we want to get conversion right and understand what it means to repent and believe. And church, we have to get this right because it is, a, it is an issue of worship. It is an issue of who we love. It is an issue of whether we're going to love Jesus or love something made in our own image. And love idols. Real repentance, Lawrence argues, is new worship. Real repentance is new worship. Listen to this. He says, if repentance really is a change of worship, then our churches must not pressure people to make a hasty, ill-considered decisions for Jesus and then offer them quick assurance. Instead, we must call people to repent. When we separate repentance from conversion... Either because we think it can come later or we fear scaring people off, we, we reduce conversion to bad feelings or moral resolve. Worse, we risk assuring a convert that he is right with God when in fact he is not. It's almost like giving someone a vaccine against the gospel. We must be careful to not vaccinate against the gospel and a life of following Christ but to truly follow him as disciples. There's one other line in here that Lawrence mentions. He says, faith not only repeats God's promises back to him in prayer, it also leans on those promises. Say it again. Faith not only repeats God's promises back to him in prayer, making a decision, but it also leans on those promises. That, friends, is faith. It trusts God his character, and his love. And it so leans on the promises of the gospel and nothing else, Lawrence argues. This is why James says that faith without works is dead. Real faith leans and depends and follows and works. Faithfulness is follow through. And if you double click on that, I think we could... Summarize the whole thing by saying faith is being brought near and then faithfulness is follow through having been brought near. May we follow him 
faithfully as those who say, yes, I will serve in the vineyard and yes, I will show up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be our help. God, thank you for the righteousness that you have given to us in Christ. And God, I pray that we would be transformed, truly transformed as those who have repented and trusted in you, not just making decisions for you, but actually being disciples. Not just looking all cleaned up and looking like we have it together, but those who trust in the shed blood and the body on the cross and the empty grave of your son, the Lord Jesus. God, may we cling to that hope and trust in him, even as we're reminded of it here at the Lord's table. We pray in his name. Amen.